Welcome to the Counselor Soapbox YouTube video channel. This is number three in our drug education series, a brief history of drug use in the United States of America. In later episodes, we will talk more about drug use under specific drugs. Drug use goes back to the earliest days of human civilization, probably even before that. Humans initially must have eaten food which had spoiled and fermented to produce alcohol, accidental fermentation. Alcohol use appears to have begun during the Old Stone Age, though every textbook I've read gives a different date for the first appearance of alcohol. It was not long after that first appearance that people began to deliberately ferment berries and later on grains, making wines and beer. The opium poppy was in use at least as early as 5,000 years before the current era. Cannabis or marijuana seems to have been used at least 2700 BC, and coca leaves were used in South America at about 2,500 years before the current era. It's likely further archaeological discoveries will push those dates back even farther. We'll talk about the specific drugs and their history later in this series. Drugs have been a part of U.S. history from the very beginning. The Mayflower is reported to have stopped at Plymouth because they ran out of beer and grog, important dietary ingredients for the pilgrims. The Boston Tea Party involved a revolt against the crown because the government had placed a tax on tea which made it so expensive that it, the average middle class family could no longer afford it. In a sense, the Boston Tea Party was about America's right to have its caffeine. As a result of the U.S. Revolution, America shifted largely to coffee rather than tea. We also had a major political event, the Whiskey Rebellion, in which local producers of whiskey went to battle with the U.S. government over their rights to produce whiskey and their resistance to the government taxing it. To this day, moonshiners make untaxed alcohol in a number of locations. The white people, when they arrived, were not the first in North America to use any kind of drugs. The Aztecs fermented a beverage from the fruits of the cactus, pulque. Also, a lot of Native American tribes used a native tobacco. That tobacco was quite different from what we use today. It was a smaller plant and produced less nicotine. It was also mixed with other ingredients, sages and willow bark, which contains a natural form of aspirin. Peyote was used in the Southwest and farther into Southern Mexico and Central America, salvia, Divin Orem, a member of the sage family, was used, the only member which uh, creates hallucinations that we are aware of. These were used by native peoples as a religious part of their uh, ceremonies rather than as a recreational drug the way it is used today. The patterns of drug use in the United States have shifted dramatically over time. In the early U.S. expansion, alcohol was a part of the Western movement. It was common for the alcoholic beverages that were served in the old saloons to contain not only alcohol, as in whiskey, but also to include uh, a certain amount of morphine, the drinking of laudanum and paragoric were important parts of that culture. We'll see that later that uh, morphine was initially used during the U.S. Civil War 
and it was used by mixing with alcohol since syringes were rare and expensive. As a result of that, there are plenty of records of so soldiers returning, particularly Union soldiers, addicted to morphine. Morphine was the early pain reliever and was included in patent medicines, uh, principally laudanum, but also in the soothing syrups that were given to babies. It was common for dad, mom, and baby to all be consuming one or another type of tonic, which contained not only alcohol, but morphine. The San Francisco Ordinance in 1875 was the first significant drug law in the history of the United States. It applied only to the city and county of San Francisco and had very limited effect. The law made smoking of opium in a den illegal. What the law sought to do was end the social practice of smoking opium, which had happened among Chinese immigrants. Well, they were the main smokers, and they had come to the United States to work on the railroad. The law only prohibited smoking of opium in the den, and there was a lot of evidence that this was racially motivated. Morphine, the main ingredient in Opium could be used in other places and was commonly consumed by white people in alcohol in the form of laudanum.
This brings up the question of what is a narcotic? The word narco comes from the root word uh, to put to sleep. And narcotics are central nervous system depressants. They're sedatives and pain relievers. Not all controlled substances are narcotics. And today our drug laws largely refer to controlled substances rather than narcotics. It's common to believe that prohibition was a failure, but in fact, the evidence is mixed. During prohibition, drinking was cut up to half. There was a significant decline in alcohol-related medical problems. Note that in one report, VA said that half of their beds were devoted to people whose primary problem was caused by or made worse by alcohol. During this prohibition, there was also a decline in the deaths from cirrhosis of the liver, and there were fewer hospitalizations for alcoholism. We also had reduced rates of arrest for alcohol-related crime. The drawback was a significant increase in organized crime as people continued to pay money and demand the ability to consume alcohol.
the Marijuana Tax Act was passed in 1937. Taxes can certainly raise money, but they can also prevent or encourage actions. The tax on marijuana was made so significant that doctors declined to buy the tax stamp needed to prescribe marijuana, effectively making it illegal. There are a number of theories about why marijuana was made illegal. One was that Anslinger, who had been in charge of enforcing prohibition, lobbied to make marijuana illegal to give him and his staff another drug to enforce. Another story is that New Orleans and their uh, situation there created a, a demand for marijuana. At that time, there were no traffic road systems, and most freight in the United States moved either by river or later by rail. The ships that arrived from all over the world to New Orleans, who was at that point the largest port in America, all had to be unloaded by hand. Longshoremen carried the packages, the bundles and the bales, up a gland plank by hand. There was a critical need for dock workers, many of whom were recruited from Jamaica and Cuba and the Caribbean. Most dock workers were black. They had a habit of smoking marijuana recreationally, which was ignored at the beginning. But Increasingly, white college students from the East Coast would take the train to New Orleans for Mardi Gras, where they were introduced to smoking marijuana. As those teens and college students began to take marijuana home and smoke it, the authorities on the East Coast became very nervous and moved towards making it illegal. Another story says that many of the Mexican farm workers who had come to Texas were commonly smoking marijuana. They would work until the end of the crop and then be paid. Well, it became common for people to report the Mexican farm workers who were then arrested and deported and did not have to be paid. Whether those stories are true is somewhat questionable, but clearly there was some racial motivation in the efforts to make marijuana illegal. Cocaine use has gone in and out of fashion. In the 1800s, it was included in tonics and patent meds. You could even buy wine with cocaine as an ingredient. And yes, originally Coca-Cola included the leaves of cocaine as a filtering medium. But we have moved from using cocaine as an ingredient in things to the illegal use of powdered cocaine later, which became freebasing. And most recently, uh, cocaine has been uh, rocked up, creating crack cocaine, a small crystal that can be smoked. Our laws have had to accommodate these changing ways of using it and later, in another video about cocaine, we'll talk more about the changing uh, legal situation around cocaine.
Well, creating the drug schedules has had some decided advantages. There are some problems with scheduling. One has been that marijuana is scheduled on Schedule 1. No doctor in the U.S. may prescribe it. This, I know, uh, upsets students when they try to tell me that, but there are doctors around who prescribe it. The truth is that while it's federally illegal and federally may not be prescribed, doctors are licensed by the states. So there's nothing the federal government can do about a doctor writing the prescription. They can, however, uh, raid and arrest doctors who maintain marijuana on the premises, since it's still federally illegal. The other thing they can do is to take away the DEA number of any doctor who prescribes marijuana. Result, doctors who work in hospitals or need to be able to prescribe Schedule II controlled substances will not prescribe marijuana and risk their DEA number. Another law that's uh, occurred since is the Analog Act in 1986. This came about because chemists were making up designer varieties of heroin, principally, but other drugs. And since that was a new drug with a slightly different formula, the molecule had been tweaked in some way, they were not scheduled and therefore uh, were not illegal. The Synthetic Drug Act now says if the drug looks like the formula for a regulated drug, a scheduled drug, and has similar effects, it is also illegal, just like the one that has been made illegal or regulated. Alcohol and tobacco, since they've been around so long, are not scheduled. Uh, and the Food and Drug Administration, not the Drug Enforcement Agency, controls these drugs. There's been a lot of resistance to imposing any additional uh, licensing requirements on either of these drugs. There's some other drug-related events we need to consider. One of those has been the war on drugs. It's gone on for a very long time now with limited results. Over a 20-year period, the number of people in prison rose over 1,100%, most of those behind drugs. Despite all the money spent on border interdiction, trying to stop drugs coming into the country, drugs on the street appear to be even more available and at lower prices than before the war on drugs. There's also been a lot of casualties in the war on drugs. A lot of kids have grown up with one or both parents in jail or prison because of drug arrests. We've also had a passage of a significantly larger number of laws. Another new area is drug testing. There's been a lot of discussion and controversy about who can be tested, when they can be tested, uh, how accurate tests are. Increasingly, we will see the use of drug testing in an effort to uh, detect people who are using drugs. There's a controversy around athletic use and at athletic use at all levels. High school athletes uh, are sometimes, maybe commonly, tested for drugs. But professional athletes uh, often have been uh, involved in scandals because of drug use. The Olympics test drugs uh, repeatedly. Other things we need to think about are efforts to prevent drug use in the first place. And we'll talk about that in another video. And drug treatment efforts have begun to become an established field of counseling. We'll talk about that in probably more than one upcoming video. What's ahead for the Counselor Soapbox video channels series on drug education? Next up, Drug Education Part 4. Is drug use a good thing or bad? What are some of the pros and cons? If you have enjoyed this video, please click the like button directly below, and comments are always appreciated. For more information, please visit the CounselorSoapbox.com blog, where you will find articles on mental health, substance abuse, and having a happy life. 
the David Joe Miller fiction and nonfiction books are available on Amazon.